I want to begin this Devo video with a prayer from Walter Brueggemann's Prayers for a Privileged People. He has one called Hearing Better Voices on Reading the Prophets. So we're about to encounter prophecy. I thought it would be helpful to enter with prayer. We make a pause amid many voices, some innocent and some seductive, some violent and some coercive, some forgiven and some genuine, some not. Amid this cacophony that pulls us in many directions, we have these old voices of your prophets. These voices attest to your fierce self, your severe summons, your generous promise, your abiding presence. Give us good ears. Perchance, you have a word for us tonight. Give us grace and courage to listen, to answer, to care, and to rejoice, that we may be more full of your people. We're going to explore a large chunk of the book of Amos. This is chapter 8, verse 3, all the way through 9, verse 10. So, to many of you, if you've been along for this exploration, you'll notice that a lot of these themes that have come before take place again. And so let's just prime for that a little bit. We have the pointing out of injustice in Israelite society. We have a acknowledgement that God is coming in judgment and that it will be not exactly what they expect. They expect, you know, some redemptive uh, day of light, but the day of the Lord actually is going to be a time of, of darkness for them because they're out of sync with God. And then the third piece, that the response to those two first things is lament, that they're invited to mourn, to, to weep, uh, to enter a, a funeral song. Here we go. Listen for things as you kind of recap and, and re-encounter the voice of the prophet Amos. Hopefully this will help us kind of tie off this conversation as we prepare uh, to wrap up the book of Amos next time. Amos chapter 8 verse 4 through 9 verse 10. Listen to this, you who rob the poor and trample down the needy. You can't wait for the Sabbath day to be over and the religious festivals to end so you can get back to cheating the helpless. You measure out grain with dishonest measures and cheat the buyer with dishonest scales. And you mix the grain you sell with chaff swept from the floor. Then you enslave poor people for one piece of silver or a pair of sandals. Now the Lord has sworn this oath by his own name, the pride of Israel. I will never forget the wicked things you have done. The earth will tremble for your deeds and everyone will mourn. The ground will rise like the Nile at flood time. It will heave up and sink again. In that day, says the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth while it is still day. I will turn your celebrations into times of mourning and your singing into weeping. You will wear funeral clothes and shave your heads to show your sorrow as if your only son had died. How very bitter that day will be. The time is coming, says the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from border to border, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Beautiful girls and strong young men will grow faint in that day, thirsting for the Lord's word. And those who swear by the shameful idols of Samaria, who take oaths in the name of the God of Dan and make vows in the name of the God of Beersheba, they will all fall down, never to rise again. Then I saw a vision of the Lord standing beside the altar. He said, strike the tops of the temple columns so that the foundation will shake. Bring down the roof on the heads of the people below. I will kill with the sword those who survive. No one will escape. Even if they dig down to the place of the dead, I will reach down and pull them up. Even if they climb up into the heavens, I will bring them down. Even if they hide at the very top of Mount Carmel, I will search them out and capture them. Even if they hide at the bottom of the sea, I will send the sea serpent after them to bite them. Even if their enemies drive them into exile, I will command the sword to kill them there. I am determined to bring disaster upon them and not to help them. The Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies, it touches the land and it melts and all the people mourn. The ground rises like the Nile River at flood time. Then it sinks again. The Lord's home reaches up to the heavens while its foundations is here on the earth. He draws up water from the ocean and pours it down as rain on the land. The Lord is his name. Are you Israelites more important to me than the Ethiopians? Asked the Lord. 
I brought Israel out of Egypt, but I also brought the Philistines from Crete and the Arameans out of Kerr. I, the Lord, am watching this sinful nation of Israel. I will destroy it from the face of the earth, but I will never completely destroy the family of Israel, says the Lord. For I will give the command and will shake Israel along with the other nations as grain is shaken from a, in a sieve. Yet not one true kernel will be lost, but all the sinners will die by the sword. All those who say nothing bad will happen to us. As Amos has this relentless interest in keeping injustice a part of the conversation, I think if we fully take seriously biblical prophecy and, and hear the voices, I think we'll see that we need to keep that conversation in front of us, church. That God does come to make things right. And I, I think we should learn to take hope in that. Now, uh, the thing is about that for Israel is that they thought they were in a good place with God, and it turns out that they weren't. And those who were listening to this message were invited to do one thing in response to that. One thing in particular, and it's called lament. As we'll see, lament will, will do something for our relationship with God. I have no doubt of that. It was supposed to do something for the people listening to Amos' voice. If they were to enter into this lament, and, and we saw in, in Nineveh with Jonah's ministry, as strange as Jonah's ministry was, when the people lamented God, but we have to stare at the injustice. We have to realize that God is coming against it. And our response, lament, can help bring us to God in a wonderful way. It is a spiritual discipline we're going to be unpacking in, in coming weeks. And I'm excited about that. And it is both a corporate expression, something that we can do together. And it's also something that we can do individually. So if you've ever felt overwhelmed by the headlines or any of the... the limitless injustices that happen on a daily basis around the world, in our own country, in our own place, that there is a biblical response to this. And feeling broken and saddened by it all is actually part of our responsibility before God. So God is not far from the pain, he's not far from the humility and the brokenness of grief. But God himself knows intimately the discipline of lament. So find God there. Let's find God there. As we look at the injustices, let's not get defensive about everything and argue about the nuance of everything, but enter, not with the pride of correction, not with the pride of having all the right answers, but with the humility brokenness, the humility of lament. So guys, what happens next after this pattern that we've seen before? Well, God points out the idols, right? The shame of Samaria, these, these list of idols and these cultic places where they were enshrined. So yeah, it, it seems a bit obvious to us, right? Like <laughs> I don't have a statue of some other God laying around, but I want us to think about it seriously because one of the barriers to entering this uh, this acknowledgement of injustice, this acknowledgement that God is coming against it, and this plea to to repentance and through the discipline of lament, and one of the barriers and one of the shapers in, in this issue is, is idolatry. So we've we've wrestled with this in the history of Northern Kingdom Israel, and we need to keep that in mind. And at the same time, I, I think it's time. Like, let's assess ourselves. Like, where are our idols? Uh, you know, we can think about this from an individual context, right? Uh, maybe one of my idols, if I think about what preoccupies me, what where it, my, my center of time, center of, of, of something that begins to warp and, and, and shape who I am, might be the rectangle I'm talking to, this, this thing we call the phone or the screen, right? So... Yeah, that individually, I think, and corporately, perhaps we could argue that that's a pervasive uh, uh, question mark about, you know, is this thing taking precedent over my life? Is it, is it shaping me? Uh, is, it, is it making me different? But, but idols, what idols do we have as a whole, as a nation, as, as a, you know, American Christianity? Does it have idols? Some of those idols might be the enshrinement of political parties. 
So what other idols? Could you guys point out, could you make a list of some idols maybe that you individually uh, are tempted to enshrine and to, to center in your life? Or idols that you see American Christians following? What, what we have is an opportunity to, to hear the prophet is that we, we hear that idolatry is a problem for them and we've seen that injustice is a problem for them and we've seen that, that infidelity to God is a problem for them and then we're asking ourselves how these things play out in our lives and, and that's what I want us to do. I, I, I want to engage in a dialogue where we're, we're hearing the prophetic voice and we're assessing ourselves before God and that I think is only done through humility. So there's a barrier to humility and it's a it's a form of pride and in this case it's called exceptionalism and that's what amos denounces next so what is exceptionalism well this belief that, that your country you corporately this whatever part of people group you're part of you know we can think of this as a as a, as a national concept right like the idea of israelite exceptionalism that you're the main characters, hands down, main characters. Now, <laughs> as an American myself, I think I can, I think I can probe a little bit. It's hard not to see us as the main character of the global narrative, isn't it? Why is that? Well, it's the pride, the corporate pride of exceptionalism, and it's not good. It's not healthy. And if anybody had a claim to it, right? If anybody had a claim to it, it would have been Israel. Right, because because they were chosen, they were they were elected uh, by God to 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 bless the world, that all the nations of the world be blessed through them. Like that's a that's a high priority role. And, and guys, who do we do we worship? Who do we sing about? Who do we we, we, we string up our guitars and we and we play to? Jesus. Yes, he was the Son of God. Yes, he is is divine, uh, God man, and he's an Israelite. So, I mean, if anybody had, had claimed to this, it would be these guys, right? So, you know, keep America in check there, guys. But what does God say about this sense of exceptionalism? Israel is like, you know, I hear you on the injustice thing. Yep, I, I, I understand that. I hear you on the idol thing, but, but we're Israel. I mean, come on. We're kind of above rebuke, right? We're different. God's going to treat us differently. We'll, we'll slide in. And God's like, hey, um, Israel, uh, you know better to me than the people from Ethiopia. Oh, yeah, I know. I moved you from Egypt, right? I was part of that story. But I also moved the Philistines from Crete and, and the Arameans from Kerr. So, you know, guys, those, those are no small statements, right? The, the Egypt uh, exodus is the, the foundational story for God's people. And God's saying, you know, maybe there's some Exodus narratives you haven't heard of, but I'm actually in relationship with other people too. You see, that's the thing. God is, is, is a globally interested God, that he wants a relationship with the whole family of humanity. And yes, Israel was invited to play a special role in that. But you can assume pridefully that they were exceptional was to minimize the grace of God and also to minimize their brothers and sisters, the other nations of the world. So guys, don't make the same mistake. America is not the main character, okay? You know who the main character is? God. God's the main character. You know, we, we just prayed this prayer from Brueggemann about listening to the prophets. And we find that people that don't want to hear the prophets, that don't want to repeatedly acknowledge the injustices as the prophets did, and sit in that, that rebuke, are the people that are firm believers in American exceptionalism. That we can't critique the church and the church's history of issues in America because we're exceptional. That pride will keep us from the needed posture and spiritual practice of putting ourselves in God's presence through lament. If we're exceptional, we don't need lament. If we're exceptional, we don't need to hear rebuke. If we're exceptional, there's nothing to see here. 
and we should just quit talking about the injustices in the world. And what God is saying is, Israel, I love you, but you're not exceptional. And we need to talk about this sin problem, this corporate sin problem that you're having. I need you to come to me in humility. I need you to see the brokenness that I see. I need you to lament it. And until you can do that, you won't be renewed. So guys, I just want to sit with that weight of it. That if this conversation has been a little frustrating that we're bringing about some of the foundational issues in our country and how they play out today. If that's frustrating, if it's challenging, I just, I want to put a name to it. Don't let the sin of pride, its expression, particular expression called exceptionalism, don't let that keep you from hearing the prophetic voice. As challenging as it may be to wade into these waters of, of lament, of, of, of really looking at the injustices around us, perpetuated by the world, perpetuated by the church, that we as, a, as, as people attempting to relate to God can, like the Ninevites, remember that Jonah's ministry to the, the Ninevites and and they were confronted with their injustice. And what did they do? Well, they, they sat down in sackcloth and ashes. That's what you do if you're in mourning. They lamented. They didn't say, we're Nineveh. We're above rebuke. They said, God, here we are. Forgive us. And for those who repent, God relents. God listens and hears. He's responsive. So don't calcify in the tradition of Jeroboam II's Israel, claiming a, a national pride, claiming exceptionalism. But let's instead hear God's rebuke, hear the prophetic voice, and humbly learn to lament, learn to go before God with weeping, and let the brokenness of all the things we hear about the injustices in the world, the injustices in our country, the injustices even within the church. Let them break us and humble us. And there we will find renewal with God. It's something we don't do enough of in the American church, in my opinion. Uh, I'm not the only one that shares that view. Uh, let me read a little bit from uh, a work called Prophetic Lament by an author named Sung Chan Ra, who has become quite a leading voice on the topic of lament uh, for us today. Sung Chan Ra writes of the humbling of Southern Kingdom Israel in the Book of Lamentations. So let me read from a chapter called Privilege and Exceptionalism. Lamentations 2.15 reveals that all who pass your way clap their hands at you. They scoff and shake their heads at daughter Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? The sarcastic comment by those who pass by reveals how far Jerusalem has fallen. Lament is a response to this fall, and an important ingredient in the ability to lament is the ability to recognize the role of privilege. The people of God made significant assumptions about their privileged position. They assumed a level of protection that arose from their sense of exceptionalism and privilege. Lamentations reminds us that privilege needs to be acknowledged, but cannot be assumed. Lamentations reveals the tendency of a sinful people to have an elevated view of themselves. Prior to the city's destruction, the residents of Jerusalem viewed themselves as an exceptional and privileged people. In American Christianity, the same tendency toward privilege also exists. There is an underlying belief that American Christians have been the standard bearers of Christianity for several centuries. There is a sense of being the exceptional church, resulting in the missionary endeavor and vision. This favored church status has led to a belief in a favored nation status. But this sense of American exceptionalism, and even the sense of exceptionalism for the American church, cannot be justified through scripture. Later in the chapter, Sung Chan Ra reminds us, the book of Lamentations reminds us that privilege is a standing before God that should not be co-opted for the sake of furthering a self-perceived exceptionalism. The language of lament is the language of humility.
All right, guys, we'll wrap up our study of Amos next week. Until then, Godspeed. Might I add that we see in this section of Scripture in Amos that those who do not humble themselves will experience a drought of God's Word. May we not flee from the Word of God, but instead meet Him through the discipline of lament.